Hi everyone, I'm Eddie. I'm Raj. And this is Blood Cancer Talks. We're a podcast dedicated to hematologic malignancies where we bring content experts who live and breathe a particular disease and focus on the latest advances in biology and clinical management. Please take a moment to rate and review our podcast in whichever app you use uh, to listen to your podcasts. Today, we're excited to talk about the management of central nervous system lymphomas, a challenging to treat group of lymphomas whose outcomes are thankfully improving. We will focus initially on primary CNS lymphoma, but also touch a bit on secondary CNS lymphoma and also the hot topic of CNS prophylaxis in large cell lymphoma. We're delighted today to be joined by Dr. Kate Sinowski, a haematologist and associate professor at University College London, who specializes in lymphoma with subspecialty expertise in CNS lymphoma, T-cell lymphoma and HIV-associated lymphomas. Dr. Sinowski leads the UK's T-cell lymphoma group and previously led the UK CNS lymphoma group. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Sinaski. To start with, can you tell us a bit about yourself, your career background, and how you came to develop an interest in CNS lymphoma? Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for inviting me, and I'm delighted to be here. So I trained in London, a bit in Australia, but much of my clinical hematology training was at the Hammersmith Hospital in London, and I also did my PhD in immunology there at Imperial College. So I became a lymphoma consultant in 2006, and I inherited patients at that time with primary CNS lymphoma. So then the majority of patients had received whole brain radiotherapy. Many were unable to attend on their own, and they attended with a carer, and they were unable to work. So with Chris Fox in Nottingham, really very early on, he and I set up the UK CNS lymphoma group, and we have amazing UK colleagues. But you know, CNS lymphomas are rare, and I have to say what's been really fantastically fruitful as well as enjoyable is working with colleagues in Europe. So Andres Ferreri in Italy, Gerald Dillerhaus and Elizabeth Schaub in Germany, and more recently, Lakshmi Nayak and other colleagues in the US. And I think, you know, from our trials, but also from our real world data collection, but really also discussions, they've really influenced my practice. You know, that's really, it's sort of funny how something lands in your lap and then you're confronted with it and decide to really take it on as a challenge. So let's start with a case and then you can sort of walk us through how you'd approach the patient and we can sort of discuss the trials data as we go. So we've got a 50 year old male who presents with acute onset headache and confusion. And he's found to have a solitary hyperdense contrast enhancing parietal lobe mass on the CT brain. His MRI of his brain demonstrates peripheral enhancement and diffusion restriction, which leads to a stereotactic core biopsy demonstrating large B-cell lymphoma. He has a PET scan that reveals no systemic involvement. He's otherwise fit and well, and he's HIV negative with no other past medical history. I do want to go back a step, though, and I want to ask a couple of questions around diagnosis. So if you have a patient with clinical symptoms such as the, the confusion or a headache and a scan suspicious for CNS lymphoma, How do you think about steroid use in that kind of very tricky period uh, prior to the biopsy result? And if you inherit a patient who's already on the steroids but hasn't had a biopsy yet, do you stop them? How do you sort of tackle that tricky time window? Yeah, I think, I mean, the ideal world for anyone who treats CNS lymphoma is that their patient isn't on steroids before they've had their biopsy. I have to be honest to you, we have like a 50 case lymphoma MDT every week and we generally now don't see this group of patients referred to us because we have a fantastic neurosurgical pathway and our neurosurgical colleagues are now aware that they want to expedite a brain biopsy even in patients in their 70s and 80s so I think when I first started I almost had to convince a neurosurgeon that someone in their 80s with a brain tumor warranted a, a brain biopsy because we could intervene with something that would potentially improve their quality of life so what we do now is our neurosurgeons really expedite a brain biopsy and as soon even on the smear we identify it's a potential lymphoma we initiate the staging and take over the patient so really what I'm just saying to a neurosurgeon is please can you get on with it and could you minimize the steroids and they ultimately make that decision. Okay yeah that's that's totally fair enough and so with a patient who's got a biopsy proven diagnosis of primary CNS lymphoma do you still do a lumbar puncture and you know do, do most of these patients have CSF involvement? Okay, I think it's really helpful to think about what in standard practice do we do for staging? So in terms of staging, just answering the first bit, I think of like I ask our neurosurgeons as soon as they've made the diagnosis, would they do a PET scan? Because I really want to know if it's primary or secondary CNS lymphoma. 
I still do a testicular ultrasound scan because I think that I, I don't confidently know in the PET era that we can omit a testicular ultrasound scan because ultimately having a diagnosis of testicular diffuse artery B cell lymphoma with secondary CNS lymphoma will change the treatment paradigm, the prognosis, et cetera. And we've had a couple of cases recently where their pet's been negative, they may have had quite a lot of steroids, and then their testicular ultrasound scan has shown otherwise. But going back to the lumbar puncture, I think it's really important to acknowledge that CSF involvement, you know, CSF protein in a number of different studies is prognostic. So it has value. So in any clinical trial, we would always advocate for CSF to be performed. And in about 10 to 15% of cases with primary CNS lymphoma, there is evidence of CSF involvement. In secondary, it is higher, and that's in secondary, I give intrathecals. In primary, I don't. The important thing to say is that in standard practice, because it doesn't influence my therapeutic decision, I don't actually routinely perform CSF on everyone. And I guess to finish off the staging question, do, you know, obviously they need an MRI of their brain, but do they need an MRI of the rest of the spine? Yeah, again, in the setting of PET, and again, will it influence my, my treatment decisions? In primary CNS lymphoma, I actually don't outside the setting of a trial. I think in secondary CNS lymphoma, you think, will it alter, you know, your management in some ways? But I think generally for both of these diseases, I treat with systemic therapy, aiming for autografting in both so, you know, because we have such a throughput of patients, I don't routinely do it in all. And in addition to that, nowadays, I don't routinely do a marrow after having done a PET. And I think data at ASH last year supported that approach. Yeah, absolutely. So now you've got our fit, health, health, well, previously healthy person with primary CNS lymphoma. How do you think about approaching treatment? Well, I think that's a really, I think you even made really valid points in the question, because the important bit about it is I can see a patient of whatever age, and you know this, with lymphoma per se, but certainly with CNS lymphoma, where they can look awful in the bed as such. So I think that pre-morbid history is really helpful because any patient, be them in their 70s as well. You know, we always had that. We had a patient, I think, in his late 70s, but the story was he'd fitted a kitchen two weeks before. I mean, that was our most informative bit in like no past medical history. So I think the question really is age and performance score are prognostic. But age and performance score are not a contraindication to thinking, is this patient potentially transplant eligible? And that's almost the first question that I'm asking right at the start, because I'm really thinking about what will my induction be and having a low threshold for dynamic assessment to review potential, you know, potentially getting to autograft. And I may not know that until later in the course. And I, you know, the data that was published by the German group by Elizabeth Shaw at ASH, the MARTA study, they had patients 65 to 80 year olds with two courses of chemoimmunotherapy getting to autograft. So I think age doesn't preclude that. But I think what does, what age does do is it influences the induction I think of. So any patient over 70 was not included in the ILS G32 study. And our real world data, when we looked at the use of matrix, which was shown to be the best induction regimen, when we looked at our real world data, so we had 156 patients, those who were over 70 or didn't fulfill the ILS G32 criteria, so they may have been over 65 with a performance score of three, et cetera, they didn't do as well. But in our real world data, those where they did satisfy the RSG32 criteria, we had similar outcome as we did in the trial. So how I think of it is if their 65 performance score zero to three, 65 to 70 performance score zero to two, I'm considering matrix, but I'm really looking at their performance score. So if I, in, the, in my real world practice, if I'm concerned about their performance score, I have a low threshold to remove one of the cytarabin doses. So we have four doses in matrix. So I remove the fourth. And so I'm giving them a 25% dose reduction, but maintaining that two grams per meter squared dose. And if patients subsequently get neutropenic sepsis, again, I will think about dose reducing predominantly the cytarabin because it's the cytarabin that gives you the cytopenias, the neutropenic sepsis. While armethotrexate monotherapy, I had a patient in her 80s who, you know, went through the Promain approach, which is armethotrexate procarbazine. And I always used to joke with her that she was 
well, it's not saying very much, but she was far more glamorous than me, receiving her chemotherapy, you know, for a few days, went out two weeks later, came in for her next treatment. And she really didn't have, you know, very, she, I don't think she had really any complication. And she had armethotrexate at a dose of three and a half grams for me to squared every two weeks. So you're saying an ethotrex had to walk in the park when it was long as you don't give the side therapy. Lady, lady in her ages. I think the important bit is renal function. So we talked about staging, but I think really organ assessment is really important. So I don't do formal GFRs now because over 50 mils per minute, 40 to 50 mils per minute, I'll give full dose methotrexate. I think if it's questionable at all, that dose of cytarabin, you know, we do have to review how good the renal function is. I do assess cardiac function because it's a lot of fluid that you have to deal with. And I mean, they're the main things. And, you know, in the ideal world, you're measuring cognitive function in some ways. And in the future, and presently we're doing this, is assessing frailty in a more formal way. You know, I think that I heard one of, in one of your podcasts that I listened to, I can't remember who said it, but it was very funny because it was something like, you know, how you eye the patient and you've decided their treatment. Because in reality, in many situations, we do that. We don't formalize an assessment of fitness. Yeah, and and even, I mean, some of the frailty scales are coming a long way, but a lot of it is still that kind of end of the bettergram first assessment. I'm curious to ask about your, you're thinking about the cytarabine dose reduction, where in, instead of kind of dose reducing each dose by 25%, you take out the, the fourth dose, which in total is the same amount of dose reduction. But, you know, why do you make that choice or think about it that way? Yeah, so I mean, I think I used to have to, you know, I'm much older than you. And the thing I would think is I used to have to prescribe chemotherapy. It was always really helpful because it reminded you what these doses are. And now we're so much more electronic. You can become removed from these things. I think the data show that two grams per meter squared of cytarabin, you know, was highly efficacious in patients with CNS lymphoma. So if you're reducing each dose, you're going to potentially compromise blood brain barrier access. And I think, you know, we are going to talk about potential consolidation. The thing that's helpful for me is when I think about potential consolidation, when you think about thyatipa, in matrix, the dose is 30 milligrams per meter squared. So for many people, that's 50 to 60 milligrams of thyatipa. But when you get to autograft, and we'll talk about that in a bit, I assume you'd like to talk about autografting. But when we get to think about consolidation, you know, in a young fit patient, certainly, you know, my patients up to the age of 65, I give 20 milligrams per kilo, which is the standard dose. And that will be 1400 milligrams of thyatipa. So, you know, and again, that you can see that in the responses, you know, the PR to CR conversions um, from, you know, receiving that dose. But yeah. No, absolutely. So the dose intensity really is the message because you want to get across the, the blood brain barrier. So, well, and also, Eddie, you make a really valid point. I think, you know, we talking about older patients. I mean, Andy Evans and colleagues just looked at over 500 patients over the age of 60. We also in the UK had looked at patients, I think over 250 patients over the age of 65. And in both of these studies, dose intensity of methotrexate for older patients was really important and associated with outcomes. So it's, as you say, the dose is important, but also the dose intensity. So when I give methotrexate on its own, I give it every two weeks. If I'm giving it in combination chemotherapy, such as matrix every three weeks, but being aware, as you point out, dose intensity important. So you mentioned matrix. Could you tell us a little bit about matrix and a bit about the ILSG32 trial that sort of brought it to in you know prominence or as as popularized it in a sense as a yeah, so, uh, yeah so i think there were really sort of two big randomized studies looking at i think the two randomized studies are really well if i fo focus first on ilsg32 it had two randomizations at the beginning it was an induction question so it basically took from the isg20 study the evidence that two drugs were better than one. So adding cytarabin to methotrexate, that was shown to be beneficial in methotrexate alone. But we have to acknowledge in the ILSG20 study that was published in The Lancet in 2009, the majority of patients got whole brain radiotherapy. So the question really was, so, you know, the addition of rituximab was the ARM-B and then ARM-C was the addition of rituximab and thiotipa. And our data that we published in 2016, more recently in 2022, showed best outcome with matrix. But I think like the real world data from the Toronto group recently published in Hematologica, they really highlighted the important um, points about prudent dose reductions, about opportunistic infection prophylaxis, 
thinking about PCP and some patients even thinking about CMV, it has a, a morbidity and mortality, particularly in the first course. That's why I'm really thoughtful about what doses I give in the first course. And we found that dose reductions that physicians familiar with matrix made in the first course didn't compromise outcome. Yeah, no, that's really informative. And so for patients who are don't meet the cutoffs that you very nicely described before around 65, 65 to 70 and 70, is your approach, uh, you mentioned methotrexate procarbazine, is that the approach you take in, in older patients or in less fit patients? No, really good question. So I think when I first meet a patient, am I going to potentially auto of them? So I recently talked about the man in, you know, I think he was 76, 77, had fitted his kitchen two weeks before. We decided we didn't know that he wasn't potentially transplant eligible because his organ function was good. So with him, I really adopted a martyr approach. So that was the Elizabeth Shaw at ASH trial, which is 65 to 80. She gave armethotrexate cytarabine only two courses aiming to get to obesity and euthyroidity for autograft. And over the age of 70, 65 to 70, with a you know, slightly concerning performance score, we give less thiotipa. So we give, we're going to talk about autografting in a minute, but we I use 10 milligrams per kilogram of thiotipa and the CIBMTR data just in the last week in BMT, they couldn't see a difference in outcome between 10 milligrams per kilo and 20 milligrams per kilo. But as Mehdi Hamdani said really on Twitter, he couldn't have the confidence to say that with all patients, he'll give them 10 milligrams per kilo because of his retrospective data. And I would support that because patients with relapsed refractory disease, I don't have amazing strategies to treat them. So if someone is fit enough, certainly up to the age of 65 and some up to the age of 70, I will continue to give 20 milligrams per kilo of thiotipa. Over the age of the 70, I'm doing armethotrexate, ARASI, considering an autograft with 10 milligrams per kilogram thiotipa. But if somebody in this dynamic, and I'm still giving outside the setting of a trial four courses of that rather than two, although we are thinking about whether we should reduce that to get patients to autograft earlier. But I am, I, so I'm still giving, so I'm assessing them for autograft, but if I decide they're not fit for autograft, or even if I know that at the start, that's when I adopt the Promain approach. So the Promain approach is armethotrexate with an oral alkylator with procarbazine. So that's given for the first 14 days in, the, in every third cycle of methotrexate, and it's six months of oral procarbazine. So it's a maintenance approach. And there is a study in elderly patients conducted by Andres Ferreri at the minute in the RSG groups, and he's looking at procarbazine or lenalidomide maintenance. So asking, is there a better maintenance in the non-transplant eligible population? Yeah, great, that's really helpful. All right. So now this is a good segue to move to consolidation. So how do you think about approaching consolidation? As you just said, uh, thiotipa uh, with autograft uh, versus whole brain radiation therapy. Which one do you pick and why pick one over the other? I think it's really an important question, Raj. And I think in a way, the way I've answered the question really highlights that I'm thinking about that question when I meet the patient at diagnosis, because that influences my induction decision. And I would also say, I don't know what proportion will get to autograft when I first meet them. But ultimately, you know, there are very few people who really are, I think, transplant ineligible, because once you reduce that thiotipa dose, it's, you know, we can give, do an autograft in the AMBI setting with 10 milligrams per kilo. So the randomized data that exists, I mentioned ILSG32 about its induction randomization. But what I would like to go on to say is both the ILSG32 study and the Lisa Led Precy study had a consolidation question. And their consolidation question was the same as ours in ILSG32, which was thiotipa based autograph versus whole brain radiotherapy. And we both published our data around 2016. We, we also all both updated our data in 2022. And what they both shown is that your cognitive decline with whole brain radiotherapy is a really worrying outcome. And it supports for cognitive function 
to adopt Thiatipa-based autograft. In the French study, they randomized upfront pre-induction, and they actually showed a progression-free survival advantage with autografting. So again, it supports that treatment strategy. So I would probably say in first line, I'm really keen to avoid whole brain radiotherapy. We know it's a whole brain disease. We, there's no real role for focal radiotherapy. So I'm keen to avoid it. I think we can acknowledge that the Sloan Kettering group and the LISA group more recently published data on 23.6 gray radiotherapy. So a lower dose than standardly used. The one thing I would say is it's retrospective data, not much data in the over 60 patient, patients over the age of 60 years. And also in terms of robust neurocognitive assessment, I just don't have the confidence to enthuse about that consolidation strategy. Although I can acknowledge if you can't mobilize stem cells, it may be something to discuss with a patient because of course it could potentially reduce the risk of relapse and at a low dose may not compromise cognition significantly. Is there any strict age cutoff above which you would absolutely not do autograph, like 80, for example? Or, or I haven't autographed as someone over 80, but I think what's um, interesting is in the Zuma 7 study, which was, as you know, second line randomized question, you had to be autographed eligible. And in America, I think a patient over the age of 80 was included. So I haven't done. And I have to say, I have, I'm happy giving patients you know, the Promain approach, you know, into their 80s. So it's, I, the thing I find harder is when they ask me to sign off their DVLA driving forms that they can still drive at 82, having received their treatment for primary CNS lymphoma. But then I probably adopt that same approach to my own father, who's at a similar age, and he hasn't had CNS lymphoma. <laughs> Right. So there have been a few studies, as you know, trying to de-escalate consolidation. For example, the updated results from the IELSG 43 trial that were presented just recently at Lugano. Uh, can you tell us what was the take-home message from those from that trial? Yeah. So Gerard Illerhaus, who led that study in Germany, it was also, you know, a number of ILSG groups also participated in that study. He presented the initial data as a late breaking at ASH. And then he then updated the data at ICML. So it asked a really important question and also the Alliance group, they also were asking a very similar question and Tracy Batchelor presented his data earlier at ASCO. So in both groups, they were asking the question, could you de-escalate consolidation? Do you need to do a thiotipa based autograft or could you just instead do further form of chemo consolidation. The ISG 43 study, which is slightly confusingly called the matrix study, you know, randomized patients after they'd completed four courses of matrix and they randomized patients between DVIC, which is really like our ice versus a thiotipa based autograft. And what was really interesting about their data was that the response rate at the end of the consolidation was similar but in, after very short follow-up, but even we have data beyond two years now, the PFS and overall survival was significantly better post-autograft. So despite the initial you know, response rates on MRI, but the response data really supports our ongoing practice to consider autografting. And I don't offer chemo consolidation in patients if I can autograph them. All right. And what's your approach to patients in partial remission? Like how good does a PR need to be for someone to be eligible for auto autograft consolidation? I think that's a really relevant question. And I have to say that I am very happy to offer an autograph to a patient in CR and PR. In RSG 32, we included patients with stable disease, and I wouldn't exclude that consolidation strategy for this group of patients. And I think my sort of rationale, I've sort of mentioned about thiotipa dose that you get with an autograft, but also we know from RSG 32 and other studies that PR to CR conversion post autografting is really considerable. So I really believe in the potential benefit of um, that form of consolidation strategy. And in very few patients, because we, you know, we have responsibility for you know, NHS funding, but I've had a couple of people where you know, their MRI had been fantastic after two and four, two courses of matrix. And just before getting to autographed, the question was their potential progression in you know, a site. And strictly before we had progressive disease, we went on to further chemotherapy. 
But the problem is with if your matrix refractory further chemotherapy, such as our ice, really doesn't, you know, the patient doesn't benefit from. So when a couple of people who've got a good performance score and their, you know, their MRI is either equivocal, et cetera, I have gone on to autografting that patient. I've questioned whether we should consider radiotherapy subsequently, should we give lenalidomide maintenance? But in the few cases I've done it, and it's less than 10, I really have that supported that practice because, you know, an autograft offers, you know, a lot of chemotherapy in terms of potential brain barrier um, penetration. So PR, I think what I can't say to you is that we have robust data to say to a patient that if you achieve PR, you're going to do worse than CR. I'm totally happy to offer them an autograft. When we do looked at our secondary CNS lymphoma data, so we had 134 patients, we couldn't see any difference in PR versus CR. So, you know, there I'm confident whether it's secondary CNS lymphoma on MRI or PET to proceed, I couldn't see any difference. I just don't know that it's not got some prognostic value, but I'm very happy to proceed to thyatipa based auto. And so when you're counseling a patient, obviously not necessarily every patient asks this question, but how do you talk, you know, like in, in standard lifestyle lymphoma, we talk about a 60% chance of cure and all these sorts of things. How do you frame that conversation in terms of what patients can expect in terms of long-term remissions when you're talking about to someone with primary sinus lymphoma or their family? I think it's really an important question. So I have to say our seven-year follow-up of Vilas G32 showed a 70% overall survival at seven years. And the thing that was fascinating was the plateau. So I realized just now annually, I have to fill in DVLA forms for my patients with CNS lymphoma. I'm trying to work out whether I you know, speak to DVLA to explain the how the treatment of CNS lymphoma has really improved. But I, you know, it's a reminder that my patient remains in remission, you know, five, 10 years down the line. So I now use the words potential cure. I mean, the reality is I do caveat that with saying we need further data. But I think we know from the Zuma 7 study, I think was that at five years when people talked about potential cure in terms of a treatment modality. So Zuma 1, yeah. I mean, sorry? Zuma 1. No, I think the Zuma 7 study recently, the Jason Weston study. Yeah, yeah. So the Zuma, Zuma 7 is only at three years or something. But Zuma 1 is yes. yeah, so, but I think just five years. Of, yes, exactly. So, yeah, sorry, three years. Apologies. But I think the thing I would say is I'm encouraged by thiotipa-based auto. And the thing that's interesting, and I think we might talk about CAR-T, I don't have the confidence in CNS lymphoma to, to use the words potential cure. I, I mean, it's, I'm not suggesting that it's not curable with CAR-T, but I don't have the randomized data that we do have with Zuma 7 to feel confident about that. So that, I think, brings us to the next sort of step in for some patients, which is relapse and how you approach and think about that. Of course, someone with relapsed or refractory CNS lymphoma, you're going to aim for a clinical trial if there's one available. But outside a clinical trial, how do you think about it? What, what's your preference for, for treatment approach? And yeah, and, and where do you go from there? So I, I think the joy of being a lymphoma doctor is, you know, how practices has and outcomes have improved over years and decades. There's certain scenarios where I don't have that confidence and relapsed refractory CNS lymphoma, you know, is definitely a work in progress. So I think if you have, say, matrix refractory or early relapsed disease, it's a bit of a heart sink. And I'll talk about, you know, how I approach it. But certainly we looked at our patients who had been on the RSG20 study and the RSG32 study. And really looking at the outcome of that group of patients was really very miserable. I think those who'd had, who relapsed beyond three years and were re-challenged with our methotrexate regimens, you know, their outcome was good. You know, if you, the German group have some data looking at second autographs, those who've had a good response to the first. But I think that my experience using further chemotherapy, if patients are chemo refractory, it's not dissimilar to systemic disease. It's, you know, really challenging. So, you know, our data with TIA, which is RI, which is, you know, an IE with thiotipa, but also with RICE from the French group, it's not very cheery outside the setting of an autograft. You know, experience with, say, ibrutinib, you have some 
encouraging response rates, but not durable. Chris Fox leads our study using Xanabrutinib and potentially in combination. And I have got a patient who was matrix, was treated elsewhere, had matrix, a low dose whole brain radiotherapy a few years later, progressed, relapsed, progressed through their RICE on, got given Xanabrutinib and is now more than six months post a thiotype for autograph. So you know, at the moment, I don't know that a BTK inhibitor on its own is going to give a durable response. So again, I would consider if they've not been autoafted using that treatment modality as consolidation, but of course, CAR-T. So just, you know, the group from Massachusetts Gen, General, they have presented their data on CAR-T in both primary and secondary CNS lymphoma. They had 17 patients with primary CNS lymphoma. The French LISA group, they updated their data at ICML on 25 patients. And also a number of other US groups have presented um, some cases with primary CNS lymphoma. And I think, you know, the summary is, it's a really encouraging modality. I think we have to say certainly in primary CNS lymphoma, the concerns about greater neurotoxicity have not been realized. I think you have to acknowledge that bridging therapies and data on bridging therapies is important because 24 out of the 25 patients treated by the LISA group did receive bridging therapies. And is that going to be ibrutinib, which you know, the Massachusetts General Group said they had encouraging responses. Who knows whether the ibrutinib will also impact on the T cell function. But and then also you're thinking about steroid dose that you're giving if patients you know, pre-leukophoresis, post-leukophoresis, and then also neurocognitive function. If patients receive radiotherapy, pre-leukophoresis or pre-infusion, what are the long-term sequelae? So I would definitely be keen to access CAR-T, but again, in terms of durability, I think we need more data to have greater confidence. So I guess to summarize, if you can find a way to get who hasn't, someone hasn't had an autograph to get them to an autograph, then obviously that modality is sort of tried and true and keen to try. If you've got access to card T, then it's worth, certainly worth considering and otherwise kind of whatever you can get your hands on, but chemo perhaps not offering the best uh, option in, in, in that early relapse patient. What about someone who relapses later on, say, you know, three or four years after their initial treatment? I think also you you explained really well, because the reality for us is in the UK, we don't have access to CAR-T in primary CNS lymphoma. We now do in secondary, but my sort of pain is that I see the data either from trials or some real world data, we don't have access. I think a late relapse, again, I think, as I say, the German group will re-autograph. So I think it's not something to dismiss. And again, I think all the modalities we've discussed something to consider, but certainly our methotrexate, there's some data to show efficacy. All right. So now we will move to secondary CNS lymphoma, which, as you know, can be very challenging to treat. So in the Marietta trial, 75 patients with synchronous systemic and CNS lymphoma, either at primary diagnosis or at relapse, they received three cycles of matrix followed by three cycles of RIs. Do you think this represents the best approach and this is your standard of care? Really important question. So I, you know, I do have a skewed view having participated in that study. I would say that a patient with de novo secondary CNS lymphoma, so they've had no RCHOP or CODA RCHIP, we showed a two-year progression-free survival with that approach. And I think certainly I'm very happy to offer that approach for a patient with de novo synchronous secondary CNS lymphoma. There was a caveat in that trial that patients who had significant systemic disease were allowed to receive one or two courses of RCHOP before. I will also be honest that in my real world practice, I acknowledge from the trial that the response to two courses of matrix was prognostic and patients who moved to RICE having progressed through matrix didn't gain from the RICE and had a a dismal outcome. So it is prognostic, but for a number of reasons, because we were a big CAR T center and our apheresis um, group is really challenged for, because we, you know, in such demand, I have moved to alternate matrix and RIS because it's CNS systemic disease in those who present with de novo disease. We don't have, we're collecting data to see you know, whether that impacts upon outcome. And I also, in patients who've had a good response after two courses, I only give four. So I go matrix RIs, collect stem cells, matrix RIs, and move to a thiotype based autograft. I think others in the UK do the same thing. I do it pragmatically, partly because 
the response to matrix RIs in secondary CNS lymphoma, you know, it's really important to assess response both by PET and MRI that you've got response both systemically and in the CNS. And so that's my approach in those with synchronous de novo disease. In those who have isolated CNS relapse, I adopt a primary CNS lymphoma approach. So I use four courses of matrix and autographed, and I'm happy from the data we have with that approach. And the one thing I would say is those that have synchronous relapse. I mean, it's really those who are very similar to those who would have been eligible for the Transform or Zuma 7 study with basically chemo refractory systemic disease and even worse with CNS disease. So excluded from Zuma 7, potentially eligible for Transform, but very few people actually enrolled with synchronous secondary CNS lymphoma. And I think, you know, if you're chemo refractory, you're already feeling a bit pessimistic about response and our data for Marietta, our real world data as well. And even those who get to autographed, they have the worst outcome. So even our real world data, those that group of patients who got to a thiotipa based auto had a much higher risk of synchronous relapse. And those with an early relapse did really badly. So now we can access CAR T. I'm really keen to to use that treatment modality. I'm you know, helped by the data from many US groups. So be it you know, different consortia, again, 27 patients from the mass gen, and then also another US real world data of I think 90 patients, again, supporting the fact that concerns about higher ICANs are not realized in the data from Cook et al in blood advances this year. Although the recent data from the Massachusetts General did say that CRP and sort of in systemic inflammatory response in those patients with secondary CNS lymphoma did have a slightly high incidence of ICANs and CRS. So I think that's what we would expect with a lot of systemic disease. It's not unexpected, but I think it's definitely a modality for this chemo refractory group that I want to access. So basically to summarize that if, if a relapsed refractory patient, let's say they got matrix and RIs, and if they did not respond, then you would take them straight to CAR-T, right? Like how we would do in a primary yes, refractory. Yes, I do. But or... also someone who has RCHOP or polar r -chip, which we now use for those with an IPR 2 to 5, if they get synchronous CNS disease, I would like to access CAR-T in that because the data from Marietta in those with synchronous disease after prior treatment prior frontline treatment, I'm accessing CAR-T. I mean, if I can, I don't need to take them to a Marietta approach because the two-year progression-free survival was only 14% in that group compared to the de novo where it exceeded 70%. All right. So now the next question is, you know, how do you think about the dead ER approach? Uh, you know, how, and how does that compare to Marietta? And, and for the audience, dead ER is it's a, a timozolomide, etoposide, doxorubicin, dexamethasone, and rituximab. Yeah. So Mark Rozeski, he previously presented at ASH, I think in 2018, he updated the data, more patients at ICML. I think there were something like 49 patients, maybe five untreated. I think they talked about, he mentioned that 42 patients completed the two-week ibrutinib um, lead and 24 of those 42 patients had responded. And what he was able to show is that was a predictor of subsequent response. So those that responded to the ibrutinib for two weeks did much better. They tended to have CD negative tumors and they did you know, much better than those who did not respond to ibrutinib. Now that regimen just from an NHS UK perspective is really expensive because it has an azel because it was concerned at the start about um, fungal infection with the steroid and the other agents. So they have an azel which actually also increases the level of the ibrutinib. So I wouldn't be able to access that regimen with the azel as such, but I think it's really interesting data. I think it's biologically you know, it really makes sense to adopt that. And I think in some patients, it will be an attractive regimen. I just, for somebody with de novo disease, I am a chemoimmunotherapy thiotype autographed in all CNS disease, if they can. I want to build on that and specifically ask about this group of patients who, that you've mentioned, who have initial Archop uh, or chip for, um, systemic disease and have early progression or relapse in the CNS uh, and 
you're thinking about CAR T, how do you, uh, when we were talking about autograph before, your sense was that the response wasn't so important because really the thing doing the hard work here was thigh deeper. So whether you got kind of anywhere from stable disease through to CR, you were cracking on with the autograph. But we know with systemic CAR T that disease burden is very important at the time of CAR T infusion. So how do you think about that decision of how much therapy to give someone and or what therapy to give someone if you're heading towards CAR T, how much are you trying to get the disease under control? How many cycles? How are you thinking about that? So we in the UK cannot access CAR T in secondary CNS lymphoma if there's only isolated disease. In the absence of systemic, we can't. And I have to say our practice in the isolated relapse post polar R chip per se is really good. So I'm happy in that setting, matrix, thyatip auto, but those with synchronous disease. I'm really fortunate to work with Claire Roddy, Maeve O'Reilly and other colleagues who lead our CAR-T service. And we've, you know, Claire led on a primary CNS lymphoma CAR-T study, but also now we have access to Axacel in that setting. So I think the important thing is it's a real, we've had a patient recently who's presented with synchronous disease, prior autographed approaching 70. And I think the important bits were, is how much chemoimmunotherapy do we give her before leukapheresis even? Because just the timing of just keeping her well and her performance score well, because you can't just ignore a patient for some time. She you know, was presented, she was referred to us from another hospital and there was a bit of delay. So you know, she had a large volume of disease. And certainly Claire and my colleagues would be unkeen to infuse CAR T for somebody who had a large bulk of disease in their CNS. So I think you're absolutely right. What we did with it, our lady recently is we gave her some armethotrexate. She had an excellent response. We've a freezed her successfully. And I've given her, she said chemo sensitivity, armethotrexate in our C with the hope that her CNS bulk will not worry our CAR T doctors and will be happy to infuse CAR. But I think, you know, as our French colleague said at ICML, Sylvain Choquet, he mentioned that those who've got progressive disease in their brain, primary CNS lymphoma, they do really badly with CAR-T. It's a marker of not doing well, of course, but also they're not going to gain from that modality. That's a really helpful framework to think about, um, you know, trying to get all the pieces to line up because, you know, as you say, the timing in aggressive lymphomas generally, but particularly the primary and or secondary CNS lymphoma can be really critical. And just one thing to say, so we talk about the whole communication between different teams, but of course, the other thing I just wanted to reiterate is communication with our patients and relatives. The thing that I found really fantastic in our UK trials, and so with Chris Fox, is actually making sure that your clinical trial can include patients who at the time of diagnosis, they don't have capacity. So you're not excluding them from access to agents. And of course, you're going to reassess that. But being able to have either a legal guardian, et cetera, or IMCA, you know, to be able to consent for them so they're not excluded from access to trials. Yeah, hugely important issue. Yeah. I do want to move to the thorny issue of CNS prophylaxis, not getting off without without talking about that it's issue because it's, it's such a, yeah, you've got a patient to see. I urgently appeared in, in the background there. No. So obviously there's a group of, of patients who present with systemic large cell lymphoma who then go on to develop CNS relapse and who previously had pretty concerning outcomes. And it's sort of, uh, so, so, there's, there was a movement towards giving people prophylaxis to try and prevent that from happening. So I want to start by asking you what, what led you to start or what led the field and you to start using CNS prophylaxis? Yeah, I think it's such a, it, it's, in a previous podcast of yours, I heard someone talk about CNS prophylaxis. So that was a difficult question. I will reiterate, it's a difficult question. I think the thing I would say is being referred lots of patients with secondary CNS lymphoma, I don't know whether I'm a greater enthusiast to avoid it than others, but I'd really like to avoid it in my patients. Certainly those who present post, you know, RCHOP or polar RCHIP. So I think what we have is relatively robust data for people we worry about. So people with testicular diffuse large B-cell lymphoma particularly, but those with renal, adrenal, breast, number of extranodal sites, three or more, but also you know, the very high CNS IPIs of five and six, I worry about. Okay, so coming from an enthusiasm for primary CNS lymphoma treatment and our methotrexate alone, 
you know, I'm an enthusiast and I have to say I've come from being an advocator for intercalated high-dose methotrexate a number of years ago. Okay, this is a number of years ago. Now, what we have to remember is it's a different disease biologically. This is not primary CNS lymphoma. And what I've really learned is that my belief was not based on robust data, which I was aware of at the time. That there were no randomized studies, there are still no randomized studies. So working with Matt Wilson, Pamakai in, in Glasgow, but also um, Toby Air and others, and then also the data, which is really Im um, impressive data set from Kat Lewis with Chanchi and Tarek Al-Ghalali, is my confidence to, to advocate for high-dose methotrexate is waning significantly. So I move from intercalation to discussing end of treatment. And the question I cannot tell you, is that for me or for the patient? Is it just making me feel better? But certainly I was happy to give it at the end of treatment intercalation, just really the data. So if you gave it after day 10, delayed our chop delivery, compromised perform, progression-free survival, overall survival, et cetera. So end of treatment. But the data from our Australian colleagues led by, you know, Kat Lewis, Chan and Terek al is that really, do we have any data to support this practice? So where I am is I discuss with my patients. I mentioned it at the beginning, I have an end of treatment scan that shows CMR, I do an early end of treatment, and I discuss with them, would they like to have it? I can give it in the ambulatory care setting. I mentioned toxicity. I also mentioned it may not have any benefit. I think in testicular, the data from the ILSG30 study using intrathecal um, methotrexate and end of treatment methotrexate in testicular diffuse RGBC lymphoma, it's a prospective study, but there were no relapses. It supports that practice. But outside testicular, I think if someone advocated none, having performed a lumbar puncture at the beginning, especially. So I think increasingly, like our colleagues in New Zealand, so Samar Issar and Rory Bennett published in the American Journal of Hematology recently, where they routinely, in hundreds of patients, assessed CSF. So what they could say is those that had flow cytometry evidence of disease, they were treated differently, they had a different outcome, but no evidence of CSF disease and intervention with high-dose methotrexate, again, no benefit. So I think moving towards staging with MRI, et cetera, assessing for CSF. I mean, I don't routinely assess for CTDNA, but I think that's where we might be going in the future. We need trials, et cetera. But even doing a trial, the numbers you would need, and then also thinking about the believers and non-believers, and I'm moving as a believer, non-believer, advocating an intervention is challenging in terms of designing a study. No, I think that's a, a good framework to think about things. And I think it is really interesting to think in medicine generally, but in lymphoma particularly, about how different things come in and out of vogue over time and what the, how that happens and then how, that, how, how it sort of uh, comes about and in this case has sort of unwound over the last couple of years as those bigger data sets have come out. Um, you mentioned ctDNA, and there was obviously the, the very provocative study in the ASH plenary session um, from the German group do you think that uh, CTDNA will uh, remove the need for a brain biopsy anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, you say provocative. I thought it was fantastic that a you know primary CNS lymphoma study was in the plenary, and then of course uh, more recently published in JCO with our Stanford colleagues. I think it's really exciting. I think it's not standard practice, but I think that that I truly believe we're not going to be performing brain biopsies on all, and in those we can't even presently having more data. So looking at you know cytokines, mutational profile within your CSF and within your plasma as well, we've got to work out you know robustly do it with rigor. But I think that's where we're going to go to. No, absolutely. I mean, very, I meant provocative in terms of the conclusions. I know. The, the, I, was the... joking. I think it was really exciting. And you're right. It was really provocative if you're a neurosurgeon because less biopsies potentially. Well, yeah. And less delay waiting for the biopsy also potentially, depending on how long the ctDNA sequencing takes. I think the last uh, question I wanted to sort of round off on was to ask you briefly about HIV associated CNS lymphoma, because I know it's another area of, of interest of yours. Do you approach it uh, any differently from HIV associated primary uh, CNS lymphoma from uh, patients without HIV? I think such an important question. We had to do a, a guideline in 2008 for HIV lymphomas. And I realized that actually being a lymphoma doctor in most entities, 
with HIV physicians, we treat our patients in the same way. We want to offer them an autograft. And over the last 10 to 15 years, you realize that actually for most lymphoproliferative disorders with good joint care, antiretrovirals, you know, we're mirroring outcome. But there are a number of different entities, biologically different, and primary CNS lymphoma is definitely one. Some excellent data from a group in Brisbane showing a very different biological profile for primary CNS lymphoma in the, the classic presentation of a patient with you know, a CD4 count less than 10. They've either not had access to antiretrovirals or not been compliant. We have to remember as people survive longer, there will be some patients who are immunocompetent who have primary CNS lymphoma, but in the classic HIV associated immunocompromised patient, we did a study where we showed with our German colleagues that it was feasible to do an autograft, but really with over the last 10 years, have greater confidence, you don't need to. So the French group, the US group, they've each published retrospective data supporting the study that Kate Lorraine from NIH presented. It was a prospective study of 12 patients, rituximab, methotrexate, antiretrovirals, nothing else excellent outcome. And for my patients, you know, I'm thinking about potential cure with methotrexate and rituximab antiretrovirals, no other agent and certainly not an autograft. So absolutely treat it differently and with less pessimism than I did at the beginning. You know, that's a great uh, positive note to end on. And um, we're really grateful and a huge thanks for coming on the podcast to talk about all things CNS lymphoma. Well, I'm very grateful and thank you for asking me. Thank you. Thanks so much.